please welcome to the stage Matthew Swift, co-founder, chairman, and CEO Concordia, and Ivanka Trump, advisor to the president, the White House. We keep on running, running through a red light, like we're trying to burn the night away, 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 oh, away, away, oh. Well, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here. Hi, everyone. Well, let me add my uh, welcome to Concordia. This is my first time on stage thus far this morning since the summit opened. So my name is Matthew Swift, the Chairman and CEO of Concordia. Welcome. Great to see you. Thank you so much all for, for coming. And Ivanka, welcome to Concordia, to the 8th Annual Summit. It's a pleasure to be here. I've heard wonderful things, so it, it really is a privilege. Thank you. Well, great. So I want to start with a question of putting everything into context. We're here in New York. It's the UN General Assembly. World leaders coming from around the world descending on the city. We're talking about some of the most important pressing issues of our time. What does America first mean for everybody who's visiting here internationally and from overseas? Well, it's an excellent question, and, and I think it's a, it's a very relevant one. When you think about the UN Charter, mm -hmm. the UN Charter discusses the fact that the UN is an organization of countries that promote their own equal sovereignty. So that is something that we believe in, and we strongly believe that America First is, is not America alone. So the people of this country elect a president mm -hmm. to serve their interests and, and promote our values. We believe that the world is not um, a community of nations where all norms and values align. Sometimes they do not align. In some cases, they do align. Um, we look for opportunities um, to engage with partners where they do align and, mm -hmm. um, and where, where um, our interests um, overlap. Um, but we also are aware that there are cases where that is, that is not, um, in fact, true. So um, we're very proud of, of the fact that we're representing American values both at home um, and around the world, and this president was elected to do exactly that. So that's what America First means, but America First does not mean America alone, and that is very important. And this president is very proud of this country's history mm -hmm. of being the largest provider of humanitarian aid of any country in the world. That is still true today, and it will be con continue to be true going forward. But that doesn't mean that there aren't ways we think about how we provide that aid um, in a more thoughtful way, and that's done consistent with the values of this administration. So Concordia is a, a, a platform to talk about issues. It's a platform to talk about policy. So let's, mm -hmm. let's shift a little bit from a, taking the America First thing from a global perspective. Let's talk about it from a US perspective. And let's specifically, I want to talk about jobs and our, your, the government's pledge to American workers. Yes. What does that mean? Well, this is something I am deeply passionate about. And we launched the National Council for the American Workers, which is a US government-led initiative to think holistically about vocational education and skills training. Because everyone talks about lifelong learning, but there really isn't a harmonious, um, really continuity between when you think about skills training from kindergarten through retirement. And we wanted to think about how the US government can get involved to better leverage data to create transparency around outcomes, mm -hmm. both transparency around the outcomes for acquiring certain credentials in education and transparency around the jobs that are available in this country and the underlying skill sets required to fill those jobs. So we have the good fortune of being in a climate where there are so many economic opportunities for the first time in history, there are more jobs available Mm -hmm. than there are people to fill them. That is incredible. Yet the way we collect data, we at the federal government level can't tell you where geographically the vacant jobs are located or what the underlying skill sets required to fill them are. Mm -hmm. We can tell you what industries and very broad brush strokes exist. So there's a lot more we can do just by making data available. And we were talking a little bit backstage mm -hmm. about if you make that data available, innovation will happen. TurboTax was founded 
off of data being made available by the IRS. Enough. Weather apps were founded off of government data being made available. So a lot can be done in this space, but, but the pledge to America's workers was our way of saying, look, the US government can pull a lot of levers, but we're not gonna be the best at creating the curriculum, particularly at reskilling mid to late career workers. It's the employers who know these are the jobs that are gonna become obsolete. Mm -hmm. We can take informed guesses, but it's the employers who are investing five to 10 years out in the technologies that are gonna be disruptive to their own companies. So they have to join with us. So we've rallied companies. Um, we launched the pledge at the White House in conjunction with the council launch um, in July. Over 100 companies have signed our pledge since then um, and signed for over 4.3 million new commitments, no federal funding. And it's just our way of getting the private sector to say, you know what, we wanna get involved. We need to recognize the fact that we have an obligation to invest in our own workforce mm -hmm. and give them the tools and the skills they need to be competitive in the face of automation. And because unemployment is so low, we have eager participants. Sure. So they're reaching into community colleges. They're reaching into high schools and saying, if you teach your students this curriculum, we'll hire them on the opposite end. So we have these willing partners. They're reaching into the prison systems with us as we think about prison reform and saying, you know what, we'll work with the prison system and we'll employ um, these um, individuals as they, as they leave the system um, and we'll take them into our company. So there's just tremendous opportunity. Um, I was out with Walmart uh, last week on Friday in Texas mm -hmm. in Mesquite um, with Doug McMillan, the CEO. You were at a Walmart. I was at a Walmart. Um, and I was um, with the CEO of Walmart, Doug McMillan, who's become a good friend of mine, and we were visiting. He signed our pledge to retrain a million workers over the next five years. So what does that practically mean? So what is he doing for those million workers? So it means a variety of things depending on the company. Okay. We wanted to keep it broad because in some cases, it's new jobs. Yeah. Um, we wanted it to be inclusive of big and small companies. So obviously Walmart, it's a million, that's amazing. But we didn't want it to exclude small employers. So Linda McMahon from the SBA, mm -hmm. we said, you know what? We want your small companies to sign the pledge. It's this beautiful pledge from the president um, where maybe a small company commits to retraining two workers. Well, you know what? That's just as hard to commit to finding and training two workers so as it is. So it's sending them to a community, a college? So in some is cases, it it's an apprenticeship opportunity for a high schooler where they can earn while they learn. Mm -hmm. In other cases, it's taking a mid to late career worker mm -hmm. whose job is at risk of automation and whose job will likely be lost and reskilling them into a vacancy that company has. Mm -hmm. So that, by definition, you can't classify as a new job because they have a job at a company, even though it will soon cease to exist but it's reskilling them into a job that um, will remain, will have longevity. Um, in other cases, upskilling them. So the program I visited with Walmart, um, it puts people on a track to upward mobility within the company. Okay. And it's actually very interesting because they're taking the footprint of these stores, they now have 200 of them, and they're taking old back of house space, so the existing Walmart footprint, and they're taking this back of house space, and because of efficiencies do largely to technological innovation um, and automation, they're able to repurpose this and create these Walmart academies. So it's very scalable, and they're providing their associates with resources for, um, for enhanced career opportunities. So it's, it's, it's meant to be open-ended sure. because there's not one size fits all, especially when you think about mid to late career worker retraining. But to have 100 companies 4.3 million workers. We're soon going to be announcing that we've reached over 5 million workers. No government funds. In addition to all the things that we're doing at the US government, it's very exciting. And we hope this pledge becomes a major rallying cry and call to action for every single CEO in this company to really think about what they're doing. And you said no government funds. And I wanted to ask you, because Concordia, in the next two days, we'll be talking about how the public and private sectors can work better together in a more pragmatic way yeah. to address some of the biggest issues of our time. And uh, so no government money invest into it. So then what is the responsibility of government in this space apart from advocating for it and advocating companies to do it? And then also as an extension of that, what responsibility does government have towards investing in STEM education? 
well, so tremendous. So I think one of, um, one of the first actions of the administration is, um, in the earliest days, was the president has um, the right to prioritize for um, uh, the Department of Education uh, what he mm -hmm. um, or she wants the um, secretary to focus on. And so the president very early on prioritized for Secretary DeVos STEM education and computer science education. Simultaneously, he made available a minimum of 200 million in annual grant funding to the states for computer science education. And the guidance specified that that grant funding had to um, strongly consider um, gender and racial diversity, um, because that is is a problem, particularly um, getting um, getting younger girls and minorities in, involved in um, in in STEM education and STEM fields. So I think early exposure mm -hmm. is critically important. But to the point, and and typically everything I get involved in always has that private sector leverage. So after we announced that program, um, the next day I went to Detroit. Um, with the Internet Association and Code.org, and we announced um, 300 million in additional funding, separate and apart, totally distinct, um, but synergistic, um, of uh, private sector funds that would be matching grants to after school programs um, that also support digital literacy and STEM mm -hmm. education. Um, companies from Lockheed Martin to Salesforce to Apple um, to uh, General Motors uh, contributed to this. Because I think this, this notion of computer science and technology being specific to the tech industry is flawed. Yeah. It is a foundational skill that is relevant to every single industry when we think about the future of work. So to prepare adequately um, our future workforce, we need to make sure that we are teaching um, our children um, the, and we're ensuring that, that they're at the forefront of, of that and, and have those skills in order to be able to thrive. So that's another good example of the public-private partnership. Another way the government can help and again work with the private sector is sometimes just getting out of the way. So in the earliest days of the administration, I um, organized a roundtable at the White House with Chancellor Merkel on the topic of apprenticeships, because Germany has really led the way over the course of the last 60 plus years in apprenticeships, and almost one third of the German population goes the apprenticeship track, where it's a real learn while mm. you are an experience, even if they then go on to college. Mm -hmm. So we talked about the fact that that's really never been organized outside of the skills trades here in the United States. And there are so few formalized apprentices. And what are the reasons for that? I subsequently went to Berlin um, at the invitation of the chancellor and visited some of their best in class programs um, there. I've been working very closely with Secretary Acosta. Um, on an apprenticeship task force, and now we're implementing the results of that task force, which just concluded. And a lot of that is just lifting barriers. So now what we have is we have industry coming to us and say, you know what, these are the skills that we need. Mm -hmm. So rather than just have the Department of Labor say, this is an apprenticeship, this is a registered apprentice, come and register, go through all of this red tape, which is fine if you're a massive bureaucracy, a big company, a large trade association. But now we're saying, you know what, industry, you tell us what you need. You come up with a group. You say, you know what, these are skills that this group, which represents this industry, mm -hmm. pharma, you say these are foundational skills for our industry. We'll certify it. And then you will organically and as frequently as you like update it. Mm -hmm. So these industry-led certifications mm -hmm. that are portable, we think will have tremendous impact in terms of expanding the number of apprenticeships in this country. And I think this is a, is a very important thing because just like when I think about workforce development, I think the future of work is we need to prepare people for the high tech fields, engineering, science, math. I also think we need to ensure that we have a robust population that are focused on the skills trade. We need plumbers, yeah. we need electricians, and we need to stop thinking that there is one path A in this country, which is four-year college education. Yeah. And so part of what this White House is doing and what this administration is doing is saying that there are many path A's. And vocational education is a great path to a family-sustaining mm -hmm. career 
that has been deprioritized for too long. There was a question I wanted, I wanted to ask you since you accepted the invitation to come to Concordia. Yeah. Um, and I would frankly ask this question of any senior White House uh, administration official, regardless of administration. How do you balance trying to focus on the things you care about, the policy objectives you're focused on, with such intense scrutiny <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, do you, do, you, do you watch every minute of it? Do you ignore it completely? How do you balance that to go into work every day and stay focused? So it's been a work in progress. Um, I definitely am much better at ignoring the noise today than I was um, when I first arrived in DC. And you have to be. Nothing prepares you for the intensity of the experience, nothing. And I was a relatively well-known person upon arriving. So it's not that I went from total obscurity um, into a fishbowl. But nothing prepares you for the intensity. And I also have taken a very different approach. I tend not to um, respond. I tend not to debunk the criticism. I tend not to um, say when things are blatantly factually inaccurate. Because I view my experience here mm -hmm. as such precious time. It's sand through an hourglass. And I have seen people, and they care so much, and they just want to do good work. And then they start to get Google alerts. And they go down the rabbit hole of caring what people are saying about them. And it starts to take a little bit more of their time, a little bit more of their time. They start to get defensive. They start to be suspicious of those around them. Um, they start to ask, who's circulating this? Who said this? Who said who? it? And not only is it pointless, mm -hmm. not only does it drain your energy, not only does it sometimes cause you your internal compass um, to go awry, but I uprooted my life, my husband uprooted his life, to move to Washington to make an impact. And if things were easy to get done, they would have been done already. I had a very smart friend of mine who's been in government for a long time um, and somebody I respect tremendously. I asked him a question recently um, on a policy issue and he said, I'm not gonna answer. And I, and I said, do you not have an opinion? And he said, no, I have a, actually a rather strong opinion. I'm still not gonna answer the question because it has nothing to do with my portfolio. And I said, explain. And he goes, you know, I learned when I first got here that you have to be myopically focused on what it is that you came here to get done. Otherwise, you'll do a lot, but ultimately do nothing. And I find getting too sort of engaged in the daily mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. chaos as, as distracting. So to your point, do I pay too much attention? No. Um, it would A, be unhealthy. I'm a mother of three young children who need me to be present when I'm home. Um, in the office, I'm focused on what I'm there to do. Mm -hmm. And I go to work every day feeling blessed for the tremendous privilege I have to serve this country mm -hmm. that I never knew that I would have. I feel so grateful. And I'm not going to squander that by losing sight because somebody wants to take a cheap shot. You know, maybe one day I'll, I'll reflect and get angry about it, but, yeah. but right now I'm just, I'm focused on execution. The two major parts of your portfolio, we've talked about jobs. Yeah. The other is economic empowerment of women. Talk a little bit about your focus there. So my focus um, domestically is um, on the, the economic empowerment of women, particularly in the workplace and, and as entrepreneurs. And, mm -hmm. and I think we're doing some really incredible work um, legislatively and as an administration. I think if you look at, at tax reform, obviously um, tax reform is a rising tide lifts all ships. And I think what we're seeing in terms of economic growth 
women's unemployment is at the lowest level in 65 years, which is remarkable in and of itself. But I think if you look at the personal side of, of tax reform and, and what it's done for working parents, um, which people will especially feel next year as they fill out their tax reforms, it, it really recognizes the reality that, um, that most parents have to deal with, particularly single parents, which are disproportionately women. Mm -hmm. So doubling the child tax credit, creating a dependent care credit, which is really important because the reality is that even today, in a world where 47% of the workforce is women and 40% of primary breadwinners are women, women still provide the lion's share of unpaid care. And that's to our children, of course, um, but it's also to adult dependents. And there's this whole sandwich generation who's providing for both. So having this child tax credit, which recognizes how expensive it is to raise a child, um, and provides relief to, to families, whether you're a stay-at-home parent or whether mm -hmm. you're a working parent, whether it's to offset the cost of childcare or whether it's to enable um, your child to be in an enriching environment or, or activity, um, and, uh, and the dependent care credit to offset the cost of caring for, for an adult dependent, um, as so many people have, I think is, is tremendous. Preserving the earned income tax credit, the adoption credit, um, and the child and dependent care credit. So we really fought for those protections mm -hmm. um, for, for working parents. So, so I think we did a lot of really great things which people are really gonna feel um, as they fill out their taxes this year. And in addition to expanding the child tax credit also is the number of people that are gonna be eligible for it is much, much broader. So many people who wouldn't have otherwise received it will now receive it, which is, which is very exciting. Um, when you think about also women as entrepreneurs, the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs are African American and Latina women. And in a lot of cases, it's because traditional workplaces don't provide us the flexibility we need to wear this dual hat mm -hmm. of being um, care providers um, and also working in a corporate context. So we're recognizing that. And at the SBA in 2017, over 2016, we've dramatically expanded the amount of lending to women-led businesses. So we've been pushing really hard for that, not only our support in terms of funding, but our support in terms of um, providing mentorship um, and networking opportunities through the SBA. So that's something we're really focused on and prioritizing. So just year over year, we expanded funding by over $128 million through the SBA alone in that area. Another thing I'm really proud about is in the most recent omnibus, we had the single largest expansion of uh, the child care, the child and dependent care block grants to the state which is funding to the states to offset the cost of child care um, for people, to, uh, sorry, the child care and development block grants um, for people who can't afford child care but need to work. Mm -hmm. um, so this is monumental. We went from $3.8 billion to $5.2 billion in the most recent omnibus. And we're talking to governors across the country who are saying thank you because they have areas with hugely high unemployment, particularly with single mothers because they can't afford child care. So they can't work. So they have 30, I was talking to Governor um, Bryant, um, and he was so happy about what we were able to accomplish um, in, in the Omni because he has areas of this state with unemployment rates north of 30% because of the large number of single mothers who can't afford to work because mm -hmm. they can't afford childcare. So we're doing a lot domestically just to recognize the reality of what it means to have two parents working um, which is true in the vast majority of homes, obviously fighting for policies like paid family leave, which will take a long time. Um, but we are starting to build consensus. It's starting to become bipartisan, which was not true when we arrived in Washington. Um, but it's been 25 years since FMLA was passed, and we're making real progress towards building consensus that this is good, smart policy. Um, and now we, we have to find the common ground. Internationally, 
Mm -hmm. We're very focused on the same thing, the economic empowerment of, of women. We launched WeFi in this administration mm -hmm. to provide small and medium-sized businesses with access to capital, um, which is in the small to medium-sized businesses in the developing world. We launched Women Connect um, to provide women in the developing world with um, digital literacy and, and access to technology, something I'm really excited about. We launched... Um, uh, 2X initiative at OPEC, which mm -hmm. now thinks about all of OPEC's investing through a gender lens. So when I was at the Summit of the Americas in Peru, we launched OPEC 2X. And, which, this is, and to clarify, this is the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which is the partnership. Part correct. Of the so never before have they thought about their investing through a gender lens. Yeah. So now at um, the Summit of the Americas uh, in Peru, uh, we launched um, a fund with $195 million of USG money that's already catalyzed mm -hmm. over 150 of private sector funds um, for women-led businesses in um, in fragile countries in Central and South America because we know that when you invest in women, mm -hmm. they invest back into their communities. When you shore up women, they invest in their children's education. They invest back in their families, back in their communities. It is in furtherance mm -hmm. of um, our domestic goals of, of peace and stability. We also signed into law um, the Women, Peace, and Security Act, which is the first time ever that law has been signed in any country around the world that requires women to be involved in negotiations um, around peacekeeping, which is a really big deal. This has been part of um, what we've shown real leadership on at the UN, but now it's codified that, and the US is the first country that's actually made that law. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll be rolling out the guidance on that soon. I'm fighting very hard to get the WE Act um, passed, which will really um, realign USAID's initiatives on, on how we think about um, funding uh, USAID programs, again, through, through a gender lens and thinking mm -hmm. about lending to the small and medium-sized businesses. And I'm hopeful that in this Congress, we'll get um, the WE Act passed. A lot of great things, but, but we are launching um, early next year an initiative that I would say is the culmination of a lot of um, the different programs that I've announced that we've launched Right. Um, that focuses the administration's effort on the women's economic empowerment. And, and really, in the president's national security strategy, there's a paragraph that talks about how it's in our national security interest um, to support the economic empowerment of women in the developing world because they are at the forefront of making sure that their children aren't radicalized, mm -hmm. that, it's an, that they're at the okay. forefront of ensuring peace and stability, and that it is in our national security interest to, um, and it's the right type of development. So ultimately, when we think about foreign aid, and again, to America first, outside of the circumstance where it's, it's humanitarian relief in the purest form, famine, um, and, and all the other great efforts we do, we ultimately want it to go, um, we ultimately want the result of foreign aid to lead to self-reliance. Mm -hmm. That is the, the ultimate goal that everyone should want. And we yeah. think investing in women is a great way to do that. So we'll be launching a major White House-led um, inner uh, cross-government initiative in early next year. Um, that's focused on these three pillars, empowering women in the workforce, empowering women entrepreneurs, um, and facilitating enabling environments in the developing world, which um, furthers our national security strategy of promoting women's economic empowerment. Well, when you and I first talked about you you joining Concordia, you, you were quick to, to talk about the policy-focused element of the summit, and I'm so glad, and it, it means a great deal to Concordia that you joined us to have a policy conversation, and we're really grateful for your time, so thank you so much for coming. Thank you, this has been a real pleasure. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you.